Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Gordana, can you put up my first slide, please? Okay, so the title of my presentation tonight is Persistent Infection with Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases, Reviewing the Evidence for Further Treatment. And what I wanted to do was through, go through a, just some recent, actually, case studies of patients that I've seen, um, and, then, um, and then I'll just go into some of the information available on the subject. So next slide, please. So th this first slide just shows that, that pe people think ticks are rare, but ticks are all over the European Union, if not worldwide. And actually with global warming, they're expanding their, um, their habitats. And additionally, they're staying around for a longer period of the year. Okay, um, so next slide, please. So case, case number one, 35 year old school teacher from Mayo in County Mayo, Ireland. She noted a mark on her right leg, May 9, 20, 2019, followed by neck, shoulder pain, flu, fatigue, night sweats, poor sleeps. Um, she had to take time off work. She went to the GP. GP considered Lyme, but the test was negative times two. Um, a second GP agreed to a course of doxycycline um, which is look, based on what we discovered last week was the right thing to do, um, but gave her, her only two weeks of doxycycline at that time. Next slide. And this is the slide. This is the picture that she took for me of the rash. It was on the ankle. It was, so it was a bit elliptical, but it, it appears to be kind of a classic bullseye rash. Next slide. She did respond to the doxycycline, slightly improved, but her symptoms persisted. And then again, the rash, exactly the same rash, went away and came back again in October. She was told then by the GP that she'd been tested for Lyme. It was negative. She didn't have it. She then she was referred to a dermatologist who said you did not have Lyme and declined to do a biopsy. So she continued on well, off of work. She's a school teacher, professional woman, worked for 10 years of her life without missing a day of school, but she over the period of the next year, debilitating fatigue, muscle aches, poor concentration. She was brain scanned, every test done, all tests were negative during the hospitalization. She booked an appointment to see me and four weeks before seeing me, she went to the ID consultant uh, locally uh, who told her, forget about Lyme, go to your GP and get them to prescribe six months of antidepressants. She had, in the meantime, she'd done the German tests for Lyme and the ID doctor refused to look at them, says we don't recognize those tests. Next slide. Um, so this was the rash that came back again. Uh, and also she had an additional rash in her leg. So this was after it went away and recurred after being treated with uh, the antibiotics. Next slide. So in my evaluation in September, just she had symptoms of freezing cold, poor sleep, anxiety, palpitations, poor concentration, muscle aches, exhaustion, occasional palpitations. The bloods I did, I just got them back, they're all normal. And I reviewed the German test that she had done, and it was positive for Borrelia, positive for another infection called mycoplasma, which also can um, uh, have similar type symptoms. So I don't have an answer to, to what's happened to her yet. She was started in combination antibiotics, LDN supplements, and to date, she hasn't been treated by the NICE guidelines. She had a rash suspected to be a tick-borne infection. Uh, despite negative antibody tests from the Irish tests, she, the guidelines said she should have been treated with three weeks of antibiotics and then given additional three weeks of um, amoxicillin if she didn't respond to according to the NICE guidelines. So I'm hoping um, based on my follow-up appointments, I'll, I'll be able to give you a follow-up on our clinical response to treatment. Next slide. Case number two, 29-year-old Irish male from North Tipperary studying at the National University in Maynooth. Um, he showed up in the emergency room because he had the onset of flu, aches and pains all over, and he was taking a shower and he noticed this large bullseye rash in his back. He went to the emergency room where he was seen by an ID consultant. He was told it couldn't be Lyme by the infectious disease time team. They, they said the rash was the ECM rash was too big. And my 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 question is how how long how long is a piece of string? 
Sometimes the rash is small, sometimes the rash is big. She was sent, he was sent to outpatient dermatology and rheumatology for appointments. Next slide. Seen by the dermatologist and rheumatologist in private consultation the next week, who's, who both assessed this was Lyme disease. Um, clinical diagnosis, Lyme disease. You don't need an antibody test to make the diagnosis. Sent him back to the emergency room. I received some, a call from my buddy uh, in the emergency room, an AMU consultant, Kate, who I actually trained with many years ago in Rochester, New York. Says, Jack, we have a dilemma. Your ID same sims, this is not Lyme. Both dermatology and rheumatology think it is life, Lyme. Um, advice from me, do a blood test because it's been long enough now and maybe it'll be positive. Start in doxycycline, standard dose, 100 BD. Book an appointment to come back and see me in the infectious disease clinic. Next slide. Came back one month later, all joint pains, fever's gone, systemic symptoms gone, rashes gone. Of interest, the Lyme was test positive. The Lyme test was positive, both in our laboratory, which is the National Virus Reference Laboratory, and it was also sent to Port and Downs. So I attempted further discussion with my ID consultant, who I trained actually a number of years ago. Um, the, the, the response was the rash was too big to be CCM. He did not see the tick. Uh, most people don't see ticks in their back unless they examine themselves with uh, mirrors frequently. And the response was, I don't want to discuss it. So we never had a collegial discussion. I was hoping for a discussion. Cushion. But the patient is cured of Lyme, Lyme despite the initial ID input, not because, because of the ID input. And my, my opinion from this is how can we expect the general practitioners to really catch on to really understanding this infection when many consultants are still lacking in the skills, understanding and interest in this condition. Next slide. Case three, 20, 20 year old uni student, sudden onset of vertigo and leg weakness and joint pains and fever. Suddenly, January 6, 2021, um, he was seen, he's from Scotland originally, went to, gone to university, seen by a neurologist at the University Hospital who diagnosed functional neurological disease. That despite the fact he had an abnormal MRI and he had weakness documented in his legs, four out of five. The parents had suggested Lyme as a possible diagnosis. Um, he'd been in Dundee before, Duke, and, Duke of Edinburgh Award student, although he does, he'd had lots of tick exposures, but never remembers the rash. But this was di dismissed by neurology, who refused to do a Lyme test, got a second neurologist to confirm it was FND. But eventually the GP did a Lyme test, and it was strongly positive by standard UK, Scottish, uh, Port and Downs testing. Next slide. So what is FND? Functional urological disorder is a, is a condition of nervous system symptoms that can't be explained by a neurological disease or other medical condition. However, the symptoms are real and cause significant distress or problem functioning. Next slide. So this fellow was too sick to come to, to, to Dublin, actually, very unwell, in a rollator, 20-year-old, uh, very, very deconditioned, uh, nine months later, um, after the diagnosis of functional neurological disorder um, had been, so the story was that I took was two, week, two years previously, he had a similar episode in March, while, while outdoors, vertical fever, pains, no rash that resolved uh, in two weeks while, while living in the northern part of Scotland. Um, he was started an antibiotic treatment by me with reduction, but not resolution of all his symptoms. Um, but the neurologists have continued to say this is not Lyme. They want to repeat LLP to rule out Lyme disease. However, his initial LP that he had done actually two weeks after receiving doxycycline was normal. Um, so the question is why perform an LLP to prove that he doesn't have Lyme? and they are sticking to the diagnosis of FND. So there seems to be quite a reluctance of uh, you know, many consultant specialists to, to entertain uh, Lyme as a possibility. Next slide. Case four, um, this has actually been published as a clinical case study uh, and review of the literature by uh, myself and a group, and it's referenced here, PMID. But the title is Persistent Borrelia Infection and response to antibiotic therapy. So the report describes an individual clinically diagnosed with L Lyme disease who initially responded to standard therapy, got better with antibiotic therapy and relapsed when the antibiotics were discontinued. 
Next slide. Story, 58-year-old Irish physiotherapist who traveled to upstate New York, he was bitten um, in, in one of the, in, up in the Adirondacks. One late, weeks later, he had an expanding rash, ECM, with lots of nonspecific symptoms, pain, fatigue. He was seen by the GP who did the right thing, clinical line diagnosis, you don't need an antibody test, gave him two weeks of doxycycline, he got better. But his symptoms returned after four weeks, by which time he was back in Ireland. He was seen by an Irish infectious disease doctor who said, you don't have Lyme disease. Um, and and, and um, the Irish test was negative. The patient actually insisted as, as a medical professional himself on treatment, and he was handed over in private practice uh, by the infectious disease doctor, four weeks more of doxycycline. He didn't respond very well. Over the next year, he had to reduce his work to 70 by 70%. Um, he actually had a repeat six, uh, test done by his GP because of persistent sy symptoms that was positive for the screening test in um, the NVRL, the C6 peptide, but he was told must be a false positive. He actually then had German tests done. Um, the test was the TICPLEX Plus, which is actually not a German test. It's a, a test developed in Finland accredited and licensed throughout the world, and it was positive for anaplasma and Borrelia. Next slide. So his symptoms that when I saw one year duration, severe fatigue, abdominal pain, joint pain, muscle pain, cramps, severe neck stiffness and cracking, joint stiffness, intense headaches, confusion, difficulty concentrating, reading, speech problems, mood springs, disturbed sleep. Um, I started him in combination antibiotics, focusing on um, uh, Borrelia, which I thought was, was, was not completely treated, and anaplasma, which is a rickettsial infection. And he returned to full work activities at four months. Next slide. Case five, uh, 75, 77 year old retired GP from the Liverpool area. He actually found a tick in his right ankle. He, he then had an ECM rash and systemic symptoms, was given two weeks of doxycycline by his GP with resolution. Two years later, exact same symptoms recur with a rash in the exact same location. He went to the university hospital locally. They actually took a vulture, a, a, a biopsy of the lesion and sent it for culture. You can actually do PCR in culture for Borrelia in research laboratories. And it was positive for Borrelia, but he was told he'd already been treated, could get no further treatment according to the guidelines. Next slide. He was seen by me in consultation. He'd been unwell for two years. I started him on a combination of low-dose naltrexone and a series of supplements and combination antibiotics. The skin lesion of the right ankle totally resolved, added all of his symptoms within two months. The question is, why was he not retreated? The guide, guidelines are guidelines, not laws. If you look at other infections, I treat people with TB for one year with four-drug TB therapy. 5% of people relapse and you treat them again. So would we retreat the TB patient? Of course. Uh, why do we not treat Lyme patients? Um, because there's this belief that Lyme is gone after two weeks of antibiotics, which I, which from my experience and from my literature review is not the situation. Next slide. Case six, 44 year old nurse from Bristol. He'd been bitten in 2014 in a trip to Holland. He had a rat, he, he pulled the tick off his shoulder, took, got a rash, got two weeks of doxycycline, the rash and the symptoms resolved. Now, four years later, his symptoms returned and he went on to Germany. To, there's some private clinics there. He received a total of six months of therapy with clinical improvement, but because of COVID, he couldn't return to Germany and his, his, all of his symptoms returned and he lost about 10 kilos. He then developed a swollen left knee that was actually seen in by the, the orthopedics and they had a washout biopsy and on histopathology, they identified Borrelia on the biopsy of, 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 the, of, of the knee synovium. Next slide. He was then told he could receive no further treatment as he had already been treated. I just saw this fellow three, four weeks ago. This was just results from about in the last month. He was evaluated by me, started in combination antibiotics and supplements uh, and LDN. Early days, will he respond to therapy? Um, so my question really, and this is what I'm told time and time again with my colleagues, Lyme is easy to diagnose, it's easy to treat, does not persist. So the question is why 
is it's still identified five years later, actually seven years later, in the joint tissue. And why is it still there despite six months of intensive combination therapy? Next slide. So the, the challenge really for Lyme disease and the co-infection is every organ system can be affected. And this is just a list of some of the symptoms of Lyme disease um, by body system. It's not exhaustive. It's a complication of multiple possible symptoms, neurological symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms, CNS symptoms, um, and cranial nerve symptoms, including the eye. So, so it affects so many different organs because um, it, it, it disseminates from the original flu-like syndrome through the bloodstream and goes to every tissue of the body and does not just magically disappear. I think it goes into dormancy, small numbers, and then there's this whole cascade of infection, inflammation, and autoimmunity. Next slide. I don't have time really to talk about the other co-infections, but there are a number of other co-infections, and they're, they're really poorly characterized, unfortunately, in humans, much better characterized in animals, and they're treated in animals, but not treated in humans. So there's overlap between Lyme disease, Babesia, Ehrlichosis, which is a rickettsial infection. Next slide. Bartonella, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and pneumonia, they're not spread by ticks commonly, but they cause some similar symptomatology, and they do have persistent chronic intracellular uh, um, uh, manifestations, and they can persist for a year, well described in the test textbooks. So you'll have access to these slides later, but in the interest of time, I won't go into detail um, you know, in describing co-infections further. Next slide. So I showed this slide before at the last presentation, the medical community has chosen to minimize the complexity of tick-borne infections, but new funding and research, is, you know, not from the government, not from the NIH, not from the Medical Research Council or the, the Irish HRB, but there's private funding. There's a number of private donors in America who are now putting money and resources into better understanding these conditions. So it's a complex disease and it's a complex host pathogen interaction in Lyme disease. And there's huge gaps in knowledge and caught in the middle really, I think, are a lot of sick patients who, who are, you know, maybe mis misdiagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, functional neurological disease, uh, you know, uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, next slide. So we mentioned this before, the consequences of untreated Lyme disease is if you, if you miss the diagnosis and not everybody sees the tick, not everybody gets the rash, not everybody has a positive test. So I think what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg, but untreated Lyme disease, 5% carditis, 10% neurological manifestations, uh, cranial nerve palsies, and I mentioned the, nerve, the Bell's palsy can appear years later after the initial infection, 60% arthritis. Next slide. And then this is a condition uh, when people get treated and don't get better, um, post-treatment chronic Lyme disease. And these are studies that are recorded there. You can look them up or you can look them up in the Lyme Resource Center. These are when they've had people who are still PCR or culture or antigen positive. Uh, for Lyme disease, like the biopsies I showed you, patients continue with generalized constitutional symptoms, rheumatological symptoms, neurological symptoms, uh, a whole bunch of them as outlined in the slide there. Next slide. So what is post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? This is a term that's been put together by the Infectious Disease Society of America and it studies the Hopkins either today. These are people who are, do not achieve total symptom resolution following initial treatment for Lyme disease. They're characterized as having PTLDS. In longitudinal studies of EM positive patients, so these are patients that had well-documented Lyme disease with positive rash, 10% have ongoing fatigue, cognitive impairment, musculoskeletal pain for greater than six months, sometimes 10 years or greater. Um, so the, the story is, is that post-treatment Lyme disease doesn't mean post-infectious, okay? Um, the, the, there's still infection in a subset of patients. And on studies by Hopkins, they've actually done PET scans in these patients. 
and, and, and many of them are, are lighting up um, on PET scans, on, on brain scans. So there's something residual there. Is it infection? Is it non-infection? Since we, we have no PCRs, we have imperfect diagnostics, and you can't biopsy the brain. Um, many people believe, you know, based on the science, that there's chronic persistent infection. Now, they have done placebo-controlled retreatment studies of patients who are persistently unwell after treatment. And then there's the debate. The Long and Fallon have done analysis that there was benefit, and Klempner and the very same studies showed that there was no meaningful clinical benefit. So Klempner looked at three outcomes, and uh, one of the outcomes, which was chronic fatigue, improved on treatment, um, statistically significant SF, uh, SF36 quality of life questionnaires, P.001 improvements in, in, on patients who were treated with antibiotics, but they didn't improve in some of the other uh, criteria, so they said there was no meaningful clinical benefit. So this is used then as saying there is no bad benefit from retreatment. So I encourage you to look at the original studies to do your own assessment. Next slide. So PTLDS, arguments for persistent infections are supported by recent rhesus macaque studies by Embers et al. And there's a Cohen Foundation. Cohen was a hedge funder, seven billion uh, to his uh, value, whose family gets sick with Lyme disease. And he's put about six, uh, 60 million in private funding to research, including this lady from the um, macaque. Uh, there's a primate center in Tulane, Louisiana. And they've actually treated rhesus macaques with a month of doxycycline following inoculation with Borrelia. And despite standard 28 weeks of therapy, they found persistent, intact, metabolically active B. burdorferi following treatment. And com comparable studies have also been done in humans. So Sapi et al., Oski et al., Rudenko et al. have actually done the same studies in humans, showing despite treatment, persistent uh, PCR and culture positive for Borrelia uh, in their research studies. Next slide. I've mentioned this before, that short course antibiotics do not 100% cure Lyme disease. Short-term antibiotics fail in 25 to 71% of patients with late stage disease. And these are some of the studies to support that. These are on the Lyme Resource Center. And the guidelines say, now say treat for three weeks. And if, if you're still persistently sick, treat another three weeks. And if you're still sick three weeks after that, then the infection must spontaneously be gone and you can't treat people. But many doctors treat patients, not guidelines. Um, and I, I would urge you all just to use, you know, your clinical judgment like you do for every other infectious disease. Um, I treat people for 10 days for cellulitis, but I have patients with lymphedema who have poor um, circulation. They require six weeks of antibodies to treat their cellulitis in the setting of lymphedema. We treat patients, not guidelines. And if they're continuing to improve on treatment, or you treat them and they get better, and then you stop the treatment, they get, they get worse. I'm just a very simple person, one and one equal two. Uh, that means they had an antibiotic response. And if you stopped it, that means uh, the antibiotics were working and you should treat them for a longer period um, if they're showing clinical benefit. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So similarly, this is the, I showed this slide last week, evidence-based guidelines for the management of Lyme disease, and those refer to uh, expert review of anti-infective therapy from 2004, and there's an additional publication 2014, um, you know, that, that, that you should be treating the patients, and the duration of antibiotic therapy should not be prescriptive. Okay, next slide. Now, supportive treatments, you know, I think it's very clear now just with long COVID, long COVID is a post-infectious inflammatory autoimmune condition. There's lots of evidence coming out now that, that if persistent Lyme infection, there's a whole cascade of infection autoimmunity. So I started, when I first treated people with Lyme disease, I treated them, they got better. I stopped the antibiotics, they got worse. And a lot of my patients, this is about five years ago, 
had been actually adding a lot of supplements uh, themselves. And they said, the thing that got me over the line were the supplements. So I started looking at some of the supplements as a form of immune support. And uh, so I, I started adding a lot of products. There's Revive Active used in Ireland. There's a number of products from Napier's, the herbalist. There's a product called Sublime coming up from Just Herbs. But it, my, my, my turmeric with black pepper is an anti, natural anti-inflammatory. N-acetylcysteine has been used for chronic fatigue syndrome. It's converted to glutathione. Probiotics improve gut health. Um, and so, so I've, in addition to antibiotics, um, I've used a number of uh, supportive treatments. And one of the products that I've uh, started using in the last number of years is low-dose naltrexone. I actually used low-dose naltrexone uh, back early on in 1985 in the setting of HIV and AIDS. It was used uh, with patients with HIV who had no um, treatment at that time. And as their, their immune system get worse, they get worsening, worsening immunosuppression, more inflammatory conditions, more joint pain, more pain syndrome. So, so LDN, placebo-controlled trials early on, back in the early AIDS epidemic, was used and proved benefit for people. There's now been studies, placebo-controlled trials used in rheumatology and neurology to support the use for low-dose naltrexone. So it's worth looking in for you all who are on the call today, look into the data on LDN. I find it hugely helpful, especially in patients with chronic persistent symptoms uh, following, uh, you know, uh, late diagnosis of Lyme disease or non-resolution of symptoms with uh, in the setting of Lyme disease. I'm now doing some pilot studies using it for long COVID um, uh, because there's a lot of similarities and hoping we'll have the data published on pilot studies on that within the next few months. Next slide. So is there such a thing as chronic Lyme? IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America says it's gone after two, three weeks. And if you're still sick, get over it, it's post-infectious. But how do you know it's post-infectious? Because we have no PCR or culture-based diagnosis. ILADS, which is the other organization that counters, that actually manages most of the Lyme patients in America, says you should treat the patients, not the guidelines. And many patients get better with longer uh, courses of antibiotics. I'm not suggesting that GP should be getting into complex regimes for the management of chronically infected patients. But, but, but I, I think it's important to understand that I think the patients are real, their conditions are real, um, and we shouldn't downplay the severity of, of these chronic persistent infections. It's true that if you catch the bite before dissemination, shorter courses are gonna work. So GPs, pharmacists on the filing, filing line, I think you have to have a high suspicion. Uh, even if you don't see the tick, even if you don't uh, see the rash, even if the antibody test is negative. If you catch it late, it's clearly harder to treat. And even after treatment, there may be not be complete recovery with antibiotics. Does PTLDS stand for post-treatment? Uh, does it, or maybe the P stands for persistent, or maybe it stands for partially treated. So I think we should all consider that. Next slide. And then um, I think I've highlighted the LimeResourceCenter.com professional learning and I, we have a list of references going back to the original data and the, 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 the case report that I reported, we're happy to disseminate that has a review of the evidence for chronic persistent infection. So in the interest of time here, I'm just gonna stop and uh, turn it over to Monica and we'll hopefully have time for questions at the end. Thank you. <laughs>